from family events to volunteer opportunities to community happenings, there is a lot going on in your community. Learn about all the possibilities and opportunities on this episode of Community Hotline. Welcome to Community Hotline. My name is Monica Weitzel, and we're here in Gresham at Metro East Community Media. Community Hotline is a show for nonprofit organizations and community groups to share what they're doing in your community, all the good work they're doing. And tonight, my first guest is Shelly Williams with the Portland Columbia Symphony Orchestra. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you. So, Shelly, um, tell me a little bit. You're the operations manager, correct? That's right. That's so right. So, you and how many other staff work for the symphony? We have a glorious group of two. Two. Yes. That means you do a little bit of everything. That's right. Um, Executive Director Betsy Hatton and I share all the hats in making um, live orchestra music come so to the stage. How long, is this, how long has the organization been in existence? And give me a little history. Absolutely. Uh, Portland Columbia Symphony started on the campus of Lewis and it was a, a college and community orchestra clear back in 1982. Oh wow, that is and a while ago. Yeah, yeah, and then over time we've evolved and grown and about eight years ago we decided it would be a really fun thing to come into East County. We have several players that live and work at, here and mm -hmm. are part of your community and they said, yeah. There's room for you in East County. Yeah, there's, a, sure. there's a beautiful college theater mm -hmm. auditorium, and there isn't another orchestra of your caliber playing music live for this community. So that's when we started coming and doing our concert series here. So, and how long ago was that? Three? Uh, eight years about ago. Eight years yep. ago. So this okay. is our eighth season. Wonderful. So you now, why are you a nonprofit organization? How, how does that work? Because most symphonies are, are, I mean, some are, but but what what yeah. makes you different than a regular um, or, or, or for profit? Right, right. right. Um, we're nonprofit because of the 501c3 designation, and what that means is that we can live with donations. We can take donations, okay. and there are lots of other stipulations, but it's an IRS designation. Right. So right. that doesn't mean we should lose money. It means we want to break even, but we don't have shareholders, and we don't have stock dividends, and we don't have to follow the same IRS rules that a for-profit company does. Okay. So as a nonprofit, um, does that? I don't know how to say this. Does that? Uh, encourage you to be more community oriented? I mean, what, what kinds of things do you do in the community might, besides perform? Yeah, it might, but what it does do is it, it keeps us from being the almighty dollar being everything. Oh. So okay. that, that's good our, right there, that's mm -hmm. a good And in our situation, yeah. um, our job is to make live music to right. the best ability that we can for as many people as we can. And so, uh, yes, we're very community minded. We wanna know what's happening in this community. We wanna know what's happening in the Portland community where we play our other concert series. And we try to connect with the audience one to one, not only during the performance with eye contact and applause and speaking uh -huh. and the music, but also uh, one of the hallmarks of our organization is that our both of our venues are very user friendly. They're easy to get to and we're very close in proximity between the musicians and the audience. So they're not up there on the stage. Exactly. And they don't exit behind a back door and you never see them again. They come right with their cases right through where you're standing. So you can talk to them, you can shake their hands, you can have cookies with them, <laughs> and you it. find out that they're your neighbors that live just down <laughs> the street. Isn't that yes. <laughs> now tell me, the, the two venues are the Mount Hood Community College Theater. Right? When we can get in, when as you, you well in. know, yes. that venues are... <laughs> they're, they're it's, yeah, it's difficult. It, yeah, that's yes. right. That's right. Lots of us trying to get into venues. So this year, actually, it didn't work out for us to get into. Okay. Mount Hood. So this so year, we, you, we've been using the Good Shepherd Community Church. And that's worked out. That it's a lovely venue, and they uh, they've been very good to us. And of course, Wonderful. it's free parking there, and you're very close. The acoustics are very interesting as as well there. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they're very. Um, for for your audience who understands music, they'll understand when I use the word dry. It's very dry. So when you're playing your instrument, you kind of just hear your yourself. Oh. But what that ends up doing is making a very clean, very articulated sound from the musicians oh. because they hear themselves much clearer, right, much right. cleaner. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, 
tell me, I, am I correct in understanding that you play a lot, or that the symphony plays a lot of music that is not commonly heard in, in yeah, symphony it's productions? Part of our, it's part of our mission statement to, to do a couple of things. One is to play um, well-known composers, but maybe one of their pieces that's not heard quite as frequently. So you might that. recognize the composer's name, right. but you may say, I've never heard that piece before. So, so you're so introducing people to something mm -hmm. they may not otherwise mm -hmm. have come across. Well, and, and because the organ symphony does a fantastic job at bringing the, the regular uh, repertoire and literature, mm -hmm. the consistently well-loved and well high ranked pieces it behooves us some of the rest of us to maybe showcase sure. other stuff sure. so that's part of our mission and then we also we have two other pieces to that and that is that we try to play uh, works composed by Northwest Composers. Composers. Oh, that's so, great. That's and we great. don't always get one on every single program, but uh -huh. we at least try once a season to get somebody that has a Northwest tie. So they either grew up here or they still live here that produces a work that we can play. That's great. Well, that sets you apart a little bit. From, yeah, from other it gives us a little niche. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. And then the third part of that is that we only feature Northwest musicians, both on the stage as, as the orchestra personnel and at the podium and at the. Um, as a soloist. Really? So oh. we're never going to hire a New York person to come here and do the work. We're going to use the multitude of wonderful musicians right. that we have right here in the Northwest. And how great for, yeah, for Oregon and true. the Northwest. It's true because many musicians don't get a chance to solo. They, sure. they might play in an ensemble situation, but they don't often get to be the premier soloist. Right. And so we try to uh, do a nice collection of sometimes using an organ symphony player mm -hmm. or a professor that's in the community. Mm -hmm. And then more often than not, we also try to feature up and coming young musicians who've mm -hmm. grown up here, who have teachers that, that reared them here oh, wow. and then they have either gone on to music conservatory and they come home to play in front of their family and friends. How great. Or, yeah. So, so do you work great. a lot with young people? We do and we are very thrilled that even though uh, still the majority of our audience is that the older you know, generation. 50 and older, yeah, yeah. that's right. They still are because they love the music and mm -hmm. they, they have the discretionary income and the time to do it. Right. Often you will see a nice smattering of families with young children, and partially this is due to the fact that we have the young soloists, because their teachers will say, hey, I want you to hear my student, and they ask the rest of the students in their studio, or encourage them to come. Yeah. Um, and kids like to see each other. It's of course, of course. Thing, yeah. so. mm -hmm. You can go watch them play on the football yeah. field or the tennis court, or you can yeah. go watch so them play So we really music. do have yeah, a diverse wonderful. audience, um, a completely cross-section of, of people. That's great. Now you, um, there's some some event or some uh, performances that you've done in the past. Say the uh, Symphonic Safari. That was yeah. that was the CSO, right? Yeah. Now that was specifically geared toward children. Wasn't right. That? Right. We have an actual codified program within our organization that we call Meet the Beat, and it's our education and outreach program designed to make music accessible for children, for families, and for folks who've never come to a live performance. And see, that's going to encourage the people. The, you know, those kids if they're going yeah. to be introduced. To it yeah. at that young age, hopefully they're not going to wait till they're 50 to actually yeah, start yeah. coming to well, regular performances. Well, and it's true. You know, by the time we're 50, yeah. we've kind of picked our genres that we yeah. really like. Yeah. We know what we like. We know that 80s music or right. whatever. We know what we <laughs> like, and it's a little harder for us to go experiment with new things mm -hmm. because we've grown up with it. But if you expose a child to that early on, it could open a whole new door sure. for them. Sure. Um, so yes, Symphonic Safari was one of those those kinds of programs that we developed to show kids and families, hey. Live music is really, really cool, and it's really yeah. fun, and it was a free concert in... It was very hands-on. Yes, yes, yeah. a free concert downtown in, in your new um, Center for the Arts Plaza. Right, downtown Gresham, And yes. we um, bring our entire orchestra. One of the cool things about that program is that we actually have the, everybody safari through the orchestra uh -huh. while it's playing, so you can see and feel <gasps> and actually what touch it's like. The instruments. Mm -hmm. yeah. And feel the power of a tuba yeah. right beside feel you. the vibration, mm -hmm. or, yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And really then we had a lot of, about. yes, mm -hmm. and adults, too. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I would imagine because they say, oh, I've, I've heard my kid practice in the living room, but it wasn't like that. <laughs> you know, it didn't feel the same as when yeah, I had 12 yeah. people around right, me. Right, right. Uh, also, part of that event is, a, is an idea of hands-on arts, so we have lots of other arts things there, too. Oh, okay. Dressing up in costumes with photography and building things with your hands and painting and music, because they're all hooked together. Right. right. They're all hooked together. That's great. Now, you have um, some events coming up or some performances we coming do. up. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Shelley? Absolutely. We have uh, more concerts in our, in our season. Our season runs 
in conjunction with the school season. So we start in the fall, September, and we're usually done by May. You get so the we summer have, off. Yep, that's right, the summer and off. And you do nothing all summer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. But we have two great concerts coming up, and our next uh, concert is Sunday, March 17, at Good Shepherd Community Church. Okay. And this season has been kind of a, a change for us. We're in the midst of searching for a new music director. Oh. Hugh Edwards had been our music director and our conductor for 12 years, and he did a marvelous job with us and left us in beautiful shape artistically. Mm -hmm. And um, he chose to pursue other interests, and so we are currently in a two-year process of selecting a new director. Oh, so okay. this season, we've had all guest conductors leading from oh, the podium. Okay. So they're all new to us and they're probably not all local because they're true true because yeah, you would not have enough to choose from I would. yeah there are lots of conductors are local however yeah. you, you would be amazed really? how many there are just between all the schools mm -hmm. you know, University oh, of Oregon of Oregon course, State yeah. Yeah. Willamette University etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are a lot of a lot of conductors in the area in fact we're finding out in this conductor search that it's a little bit like football there are lots <laughs> of quarterbacks but very uh, few teams oh okay so yeah. it's that uh, sort too, of thing yeah. too, ma too many to yeah, to more that. than can fill. Tough to make a decision. So though. we actually had 150 applicants for wow. our position. So, wow! Yeah. So tell me so. about the conductor that's going to be at, yeah. this, at this concert. Well, and I think we have a picture of him too, so maybe oh, we can show awesome. that while you're telling yeah, us about him. Yeah, please do. Uh, Andrew Sewell is from Madison, Wisconsin, and he has a wonderful chamber symphony there, and he's very, very busy as a guest conductor in other places as well. And that's him there. Yes, he is that's originally him. from New Zealand, so oh. he comes to us with a great accent. <laughs> <laughs> and a, I love a very a bright accent. personality. Um, I was at rehearsal last night for the first first rehearsal of the concert set. So by the way, we rehearsed five five Tuesdays in a row, and then we perform on Friday evening in Portland and Sunday in East in, County. In East County. So he started the rehearsal set last night, and we're doing some very exciting things in this concert. First of all, we're playing a piece by one of his New Zealand composers. Oh, that's exciting! And yeah. it's a very fun piece of music. And when you hear it, you'll you'll hear a little bit of the the Aborigine sound. You'll hear a little <sighs> bit of the. Uh, um, he told he told the players some of the other things to hear and I didn't catch all of them but I could tell as I was listening oh that I recognize that kind of a theme so that'll be an interesting piece yeah, that'll be a nice and then show. um our second piece in the program features a marimba concerto and oh, we have fun. never <gasps> had a marimba as a soloist in our 30-year history this is our 31st season so and, so and this his is, name is his name is Pius Chung okay and I think and we, and is that is that him there? yes doesn't that look great, That's a great yeah I, he's he's amazing and if you go to his yeah. website you'll be stunned by all all the work he does. He's wow. local. Uh, he's he lives in Eugene. Oh, really? He's a professor in Eugene, and his he's a composer, an active composer and performer, and he has taken a very well-known piece of music, Gershwin's mm -hmm. Rhapsody in Blue, oh, sure. and arranged and it, into it a marimba. and arranged it for marimba and orchestra. <laughs> that sounds so fun. So not only is it going to be fun, but it's so visual. You know, it's because oh, yeah. you're holding, yeah. the, and it's it's going to be very exciting, very exciting. You may end up doing more of that. Yeah, huh? yeah. No, it's going to be very exciting. And then um, our final number of this of the year or of the program is Dvorak Symphony Number no. Seven, and it's just it's stunning. It's mm. it's got everything in it, and uh, you'll love it. That you'll, sounds you'll like it's going it. to be a great great yeah. show. The thing that most people don't realize is they think, well. I can get the CD, or I can watch it on YouTube, or it's not, it's not the, the same, same, is it? No. no. The live performance is so um, captivating. And, and it's in the moment. Right. It's never to, repeat it, to be repeated exactly like it happens ever again on the planet, exactly like how you experienced it in that moment. Right. You'll never have those people sitting right next to you with those same notes, with that same temperature with that same chemistry. It's kind of an amazing idea. It is, it is. Whereas I like, I like you, thinking about it that way. When you listen to a CD, well, you know. It's always going it, to be the same. Kind except of. Except maybe your maybe, surroundings. Yeah, your interaction with it is different. Right. But a live performance, the, the bows and the spit are never the same. <laughs> there you go. You know, it's, I'm, and I bet the conductor gives each performance a different flavor. Absolutely, and one of the fun things that we get to experience is that Friday night is always completely different than Sunday afternoon. Really, and in what ways? Give me an example of how things could be different well, between one show and Well, sometimes on Friday nights, you can have one level of energy because mm -hmm. all the players are coming off their day jobs. Uh -huh. Traffic was busy. It's really pouring rain. Right. The audience was very full and, and 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 lively and very responsive. And Sunday, it might be the opposite, or it might be even better. 
mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. So well, they might be a little more relaxed coming mm -hmm. in. And yeah, the interaction between, and people don't realize this, the interaction between the audience response and the players is magnetic, just like in a theater. They need that pull yeah. and give and take between each other. That's what makes the music so powerful. How, how do the um, musicians connect with the audience? I mean, do they make eye contact with them? They do. They do. Yeah. They do. In fact, um, so close. People, mm -hmm, yeah. people say, I love to sit in the front row because I can see so-and-so looking right at me or I watched so-and-so yeah. right there. Because so often it seems like orchestras are, are remote. Yeah, they're very I far. mean, they're physically remote, but they seem... Mm -hmm. You know, sort of like a, a, a yeah. whole planet apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I think that's mostly in our perception that I'm, I'm not as wise as they are in this, and I can't understand it, <laughs> and they must They're know way more. They're a little loftier than I, yeah. than I am, and yeah. yeah, yeah. And it isn't true because, basically, they are people just like you right. and me. And you said most of the, I mean, these people have day jobs. This that's is, right. This is not a, a, a position. This that is you're pets. A, a woman who's a pet sitter. These are auto mechanics. This is. Engineer, oh, physician, teacher, mom. <laughs> you know, well, it's a, what are the age ranges of the musicians? We uh, have 17 year olds to 65 year olds. Oh, we have great. a pretty broad. That's pretty broad. Spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yep. that's pretty broad. Yep, and men and women, and wow. you know, it's a pretty broad spectrum. That's wonderful. So um, after this uh, season is over, you said it'll, it'll mm -hmm. finish in May. Or, right, yeah. right. So then, um, do you have plans for the next year? Do you spend the whole summer? Planning your your next yeah, season is well, that pretty much. I think what you I doing? kind of alluded to the fact that we're looking for a new music director. Right, so right. So that's going to be your focus for a while. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. hope to be narrowed down. Um, how it works in the music world, at least in our situation, is that we are going to interview several folks, and then we're going to get down to four or five mm -hmm. folks that we really think would be a good match, and then mm -hmm. we will ask them to conduct a concert each next season, uh -huh. and that's sort of their oh. audition. Yeah. So then the audience will get to see, the board will get to see, the players will get to work with them, the staff will get to interact with them and then we'll have a, a big meeting next summer to say okay who do we want to select from these so next year will be a oh, whole be season of finalists who will become candidates for our full-time music well, position be exciting too it will yeah. be very exciting and, and very diverse and I'm, I'm sure they don't make the decision but would you take into account feedback from the musicians uh, oh the absolutely no it's yeah. very important yeah. they're a huge part of it yeah, I would think uh, so. the pieces yeah. are pretty equal I mean they right. have to they have to work well with the people they're serving uh -huh. the musicians the staff and they have to connect to the audience Audience. Uh -huh. If the audience doesn't feel the love coming back, you know, you've lost them. Yeah, it, lost it's them. not yeah. as effective. Yeah. Well, we're just about out of time, Shelley, but um, it sounds like <clears throat> your conductor for this next show is going to be very vibrant and very, very exciting. captivating, and it should be very fun. So, Absolutely. Yeah. If you've never gone to a symphony orchestra live performance before, this is one to try. It's going to be visually interesting something you will really relate to. Everybody has probably heard Rhapsody in mm -hmm, Blue, whether mm -hmm. you know it or not. Right. So it's something you'll be able to hum along with. But not in this <laughs> arrangement. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, possibly at intermission, though, right after that, you can go home and and be humming the melody. That's but, right, that's right. And yeah. bring your family, bring your kids. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. We are very familiar family kids. Family friendly. That's right. Wonderful. And we have a family pack price as well. Good deal. Good so. deal. Okay. So if people are interested in getting more information, they can go to your website. Absolutely. And that's columbiasymphony.org. Okay. We have a Facebook page. Like you on the Facebook yeah, page. Yeah, you can okay. like us on Facebook I, and I you know can always just pick up the phone and talk to a real life person. I'm there every day. Good deal. Good deal. Thank you so much, Thank Shelley. you, Monica. Thanks so much for watching this first episode of Community Hotline. We will be right back in just a few moments. We'll be talking with the Portland Women's Crisis Line. So don't go away. Radio is a new station that is committed to entertain, inspire, and connect our community through programming that celebrates local music, arts, and culture. It was created to put local music and local arts on local radio, and it is a vehicle for our creative community to gain exposure while also celebrating what the Portland metro area has to offer. Hey folks, I'm Mike Midlow from the band Pancake Breakfast. What's so cool about KZME? Well, it's local music. You know, you can't go to every live show 
Believe me, I've tried. So you can tune into KZME and hear a bunch of music that you might not get to see otherwise. Why should you support KZME? Well, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if you like Portland Town, USA, homegrown music, independent radio, and if you believe in the powers of rock and roll, then contribute to KZME. It's music where you live. My favorite thing about community media is how people find their voice and tell their story. It's the message of, by, and for a community. We're a gathering place because it gets people of all sorts of different backgrounds underneath one roof. It's art, it's technology. A snapshot of our community. Going live in three, two, one. one. The League of Women Voters makes history. Our country would not be the same without their dedication. Formed by women who organize to win women the right to vote. It is now a co-ed organization. Studying, informing, and acting. Nonpartisan. Grassroots. Influential. Taking political stands on many issues. The League of Women Voters encourages all citizens to be informed and active in government. Join, Join the, the League, League of Women, women voters, voters of East Multnomah County, County in, in making history, history today. today. Hi, I'm Luke Perry. You're watching Metro East, over 25 years of great community media. our intentions. On our own, we can only stretch so far. But at Rotary, we believe the right group of people working together can make our communities, our world, a better place. Rotary. Humanity in motion. Están listos? Free GED classes. Are you ready? Classes gratis de inglés. Yo estoy lista. Transportation for free. I'm ready. Classes gratis de computación. Qué listos. We're, We're ready. ready. Come to listos. If you can do it, you can do it. What am I supposed to do with all these corks? Turn them into a cork board. What about all these floppy disks? How about a fantastic journal? Hmm, I wouldn't learn how to make cool things like that. Well, come on down to Scrap. Scrap has monthly workshops where you, too, can learn how to make great things. We provide everything you need. For more information, call 503-294-0769 or go to www.scrapaction.org. Scrap. Create more. Consume less. And welcome back to Community Hotline. My name is Monica Weitzel. We're here at Metro East Community Media in Gresham, Oregon. And my second guest tonight is Rebecca Nichols, who is the Executive Director of the Portland Women's Crisis Line. Welcome. Thank no you so much. It's nice to have you here, Rebecca. And I have wanted to have the, um, the PWCL yes. on here for, for quite a while. You, I, you've been around for a very long time. Yeah, and that's right. Tell, tell me a little bit, if you can, uh, about when, when you started. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know you weren't around then, but um, <laughs> when, when you started, what, what the... Um, what was the impetus behind getting this organization going? Absolutely. Well, the Portland Women's Crisis Line was formed by a group of women in their early 20s in 1972. And from what I've been told, I've been lucky to meet a number of them, but from what oh. they've told me is that they really identified that there was no resources for survivors of sexual assault in Portland. And in 1972, <coughs> domestic and sexual violence were still somewhat new topics where people were starting to be willing to talk about them and kind of share their experiences. So 
at that time in Seattle, there was a nonprofit being formed called the Rape Relief Hotline. So these young women in Portland decided that they wanted to do the same thing, and so they created this nonprofit. So it was incorporated in 1973, so this is going to be our 40th anniversary oh, wow. this year. It's your birthday. That's right. It's our 40th birthday, big one. Um, and then a couple years after the hotline began, um, they realized that they were getting calls from a lot of survivors of domestic violence as well. So then the crisis line expanded to serve survivors of both domestic and sexual violence. And in those 40 years, our phone number has stayed the same. Wow. And our core That's services amazing. have stayed the same. Yeah. So it, it, did the name stay the same? Was it called something else in the beginning? It was. When we were formed, it was the Rape Relief Hotline. And okay. then when the mission expanded, it became the Portland Women's Crisis Line. And then, you know, right now, though, what we are often told by folks who call us or community partners is that um, we're not just specific to Portland. People from mm. all over the state call us. And then we're not just specific to women because mm. we that know that. That was one of my questions. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, we know that survivors <coughs> of me. domestic and sexual violence come in every gender. And so we've actually kind of thought, is this the right name for us? Um, but for now, we're for the now, Portland Women's the Crisis Line. That, that may yeah. change. It might. As you, as you evolve. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, but that's something that back in the 70s, People didn't talk about men being, uh, or, or you know, or anybody, you know, except women being possibly the victim of domestic violence right. or, or, or sexual assault. Right. And, and so that's, yeah, that's come out in the open, which is a good thing yeah, that people definitely. can talk about it. It's a bad thing that it exists, but it's yeah. a good thing to talk about it. Yeah. So how long have you been there, Rebecca? I've been the executive director for six and a half years. Oh. And um, I've been doing work with survivors for about 16. So wow. it's kind of the only the only time. work I've done as a grown up is, well, is this kind of as advocacy. As a big girl. I, <laughs> well, that's, uh, that, you probably have some amazing stories that you could tell and probably some disturbing stories sure. I would think <laughs> just personally how do you how do you keep up with you know when, when um, you're talking with people that have been victims of s sometimes horrific things yeah. How do you keep your attitude up and keep you know a positive outlook on, on things? Well, um, because I've done this work for so long, I've worked at various and volunteered at various organizations, and one of the things that I love about PWCL is that we have a very, um, we talk a lot about social justice in the day-to-day -day work that we're doing. So we are talking with folks about really terrible situations and hard stories. And we're trying to provide them some hope and some options. And so even though, um, it's really a slow process. We are helping folks every day end the violence in their lives. And so for me personally, I really need to celebrate those, those small successes. Um, and as the boss, I don't really get to work with survivors <laughs> that much right. anymore at all. Um, and so I get a lot of joy watching advocates um, kind of come into their own and feel really confident in the work that they're doing. And um, knowing that they're making a difference in people's lives and then by helping them do their jobs i'm helping making a difference in people's lives yeah. too so so that's tell what me keeps about me going tell me about the advocates are these volunteers are these paid staff what well, how does that work, and how many people do you have working there? We have 10 paid employees, mm -hmm. and um, most of those are advocates. And uh, so they go through training to, they do. to get to the They do, to and then level. we have about um, 40 or so volunteer advocates as well. And we actually provide about um, 60 hours of training for all of our advocates, mm, paid good. or volunteer, before they're actually on the line. All of our advocates who we hire, um, we ask that they've already had about a year's experience working with survivors, oh, and a lot of them actually were volunteers at PWCL. I was a volunteer at PWCL Is that right? That's how you 13 years ago. Yeah, so I took a break from the organization, but um, we hire a lot of our volunteers actually yeah. to work, well, that work makes at the perfect organization. Sense. Yeah. They know what they're getting into. They know they that it's something they want to do. <laughs> right. Now, you don't just counsel people when they're in crisis. Don't, tell me about your mission. There's, there's several branches of your, of your mission from what I saw on your website. Other things you do, and one of them I think was social justice. Was mm -hmm. that part of it? What, what, else, um, what else do you do at, at uh, the crisis line? Yeah, I think that you're um, thinking about our core values. Your core values, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Which, I think it's, uh, it's part, part of, the of the mission, mission. but yep. yeah, your core values, and, and, and I'm going to read them here because okay. they, this is what I wrote down. Empowerment mm -hmm. was one of them, social justice, dedicated service, community education, trust and unity. Mm -hmm. So tell me about empowerment first. What, what do you mean by that? Well, basically, um, the way that I always summarize it really quickly is that a survivor's choices define the strategy. Mm. So basically, we're here to provide 
options and information, and then we're going to support a survivor's choices. And but they make the choice. They make the choice. And sometimes people want us to tell them what to do. Yeah. And we have to say, I'm not going to tell you what to do. That's your, but you're empowering them right. by doing that. Right. Sure. But I want to, but let's talk about what's going to happen if you choose this or choose this sure. and work through that. And the reality is there aren't really, en there aren't enough resources for survivors if they want to leave an abusive relationship. A lot of times survivors choose to stay in an abusive relationship. So sometimes when we're respecting someone's choices, we're also saying, I'm worried about your safety. Yeah. So that's your choice and I want to talk about how to stay as safe as you can if that's what, you, where, what you're going to do. Sure. Um, and maybe have a a backup plan Absolutely. if that doesn't work out. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of backup I plans bet, involved. I bet there are. Yeah. I bet there are. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and social justice, you touched on that right. briefly, but how how do you work on social, social justice issues? Right. Well, that's a tough one for us because none of our funders actually pay us to do that. Mm. Um, so we're here to provide a social service, but what makes our organization work the way it does is when we focus that social service on the idea of changing society, changing ideas and attitudes so that people interrupt violence if they see it and they don't um, mm. perpetuate violence. Or look the other way. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah, it they, doesn't happen. Right. That they know how to support survivors in their lives and they know how to call out if somebody's perpetrating in their lives as well. So a lot of our social justice is about kind of our philosophy with um, the belief that we're not going to end domestic and sexual violence unless we're ending other forms of oppressions. That we're not going to, violence against women will continue when we have racism in our country or homophobia. And so all of those things are related. And so part of our mission is to not just talk about domestic and sexual violence, but talk about what would equality look like across the board and how do we work towards that. That's a big, big it's undertaking. Big. Yeah. <laughs> it is a big undertaking. Yep. Dedicated service. What, what are you referring to when you say dedicated service? Well, that really has to do a little bit with PWCL's legacy of being around as long as we have. A lot of people who you meet who do social, who does social work in Portland, they may have volunteered at PWCL over the last 40 mm -hmm. years. Um, so we are a group of folks who are really dedicated to the work that we're doing. and. Um, we really, as individuals, I think, believe in the mission and in the ultimate goal of ending domestic and sexual violence. How long do your volunteers usually stick around? What, is there, you know, do, is it something that you burn out on quickly or do? I think that you definitely can. Um, you know, one of the things that I often say to volunteers is that they're choosing, choosing to see the world differently mm -hmm. because you can exist without, you know, thinking that advertisement is sexist, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're talking about you know, how all those things kind of chip away at, at women's safety and um, how they create sexism, then you have to be willing to kind of think about that in your own life. And mm. so... Um, kind of some, a wake-up call sometimes, sometimes I imagine. Yeah. yeah, so some people, they go through our whole training and then never want to volunteer uh -huh. because it was enough. But they probably learned something they and learned got something lot. out of it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so we ask all of our direct service volunteers to be with us for at least six months. And I don't know kind of across the board um, how long they stay, but I think that about 80% of them exceed what we ask of them. Oh, so they're still with cool. us an hour, or not an hour, a year. <laughs> a year later. A year yeah. later, two years later. And then, like I said, often they might actually get a job and, and end up working with PWCL. Good, yeah. good deal. Community education, that's sort of self-explanatory, but in what areas, how do you educate the community? Is it, is it um, do you actually go out and do workshops or anything like that? We do, yeah. We have a volunteer coordinator who kind of manages all those requests and she also works with a group of volunteers in a speakers bureau. Mm -hmm. And so our speaker bureau volunteers are um, trained to talk a little bit about PWCL so they can go into a neighborhood association or a oh, faith okay. community and just explain what does PWCL do and what do you, how can you support it. And then they're also trained to provide education around domestic and sexual violence and then um, just how to advocate for survivors and how to make sure that people have the resources that they're hoping for. What about schools? Are you allowed to go, have you ever been allowed to go into schools and talk? Yes, yeah. yeah. Most schools are happy to have advocates come and talk about healthy relationships or dating violence. I would think, especially at the high school level, it would be, I would think, would be really important. Absolutely. Because a lot of 
a lot of kids don't have boundaries. They don't know mm -hmm. what their boundaries should be right. and that kind of thing. And, and I don't think and we do a, a healthy good job relationship. teaching yeah. kids no, 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 <laughs> what a healthy no, relationship looks I don't think so like. either. Yeah. yeah, so we do go into schools. We have an advocate who works specifically with youth. And so um, that person has gone into the community and tried to just build relationships with schools. And we've actually also tried to provide services in high schools, and that's actually a little bit harder for us because um, we don't, our staff are not mandatory reporters unless they're a licensed uh, social worker or something, right. the equivalent of that. And so um, the schools would like us to be mandatory oh. reporters. So sometimes sure. that's hard for us. Yeah, that yeah. would be difficult. Um, and the last one, trust and unity. That mm -hmm. seems sort of obscure What, what <laughs> as, as, as part of your core values. So right. what, what, what is that referring to? Well, when we created those core values, the agency was at a time where there was a huge leadership turnover. I had just started, and uh -huh. these values came out of a strategic planning process that we did in 2006. And so it was that was really about regrouping and okay. um, relying on each other. Trust and unity in each other. and Absolutely. You know, assuming good intent of our dedication to the organization and then also um, knowing that we can rely on each other. And so we're actually doing a strategic planning process again right now. It's and a huge undertaking. Know, we we just did that this year too. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, oh my goodness. It always seems to take a long time. Yeah. And so we're actually revisiting that one around. You know, we've kind of accomplished the intention from 2006. What is this about now? Yeah. So it's really about so that, that each may other. change yeah. next year. If I have you back on again, it may <laughs> say something new. different. Yeah. But you've been there six years, so obviously, you know, the trust in you <laughs> has, has worked out okay. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Now, um, you have uh, events periodically. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you have coming up soon? Well, we have our 40th birthday party. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> now, when does that take place? That's April 5th, so the first, the first Friday of April. And April is actually Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so that's one of the reasons we chose that date, because we were, um, we, the organization started to serve sexual assault survivors and um, we have a event called safety in numbers every year it's our annual auction and dinner and so we're going to have safety numbers um, to begin the evening and then we're going to have a birthday party after that that oh, starts fun. at eight o'clock and for the birthday party I mean of course I want people to come to the dinner and the sure auction, sure and where, is, where does that take place? it's at the melody ballroom okay okay and they have two ballrooms so the dinner will be downstairs and then the after birthday party will be upstairs and because you know I'm so excited to celebrate the 40th and feel so proud of the agency to have you know made it so long I really want that birthday party to be a celebration for the community okay. so just really trying to encourage anyone who's ever volunteered or called oh, or participated in the yeah. organization to come that evening and just you know or if you're have just a, a supporter party. if Absolutely. you're somebody that supports the mission and the, the goals yeah. of the organization yeah. then, then come we'll have to a you. band and oh, dance fun. and you know have and party hardy that's right. <laughs> that sounds like fun <laughs> that sounds great mm -hmm. so that is you said it's uh april 5th that's right 40th birthday party yeah see by the time you turn 40 you'll have already had i'll already 40th know how to do party. it yeah <laughs> Do it all again. Yes. There's another one I know that I, I saw on your website called Bike Back the Night. Yes. Now that's not just local, is it? No. Um, there, it's actually it's a Portland spin on Take Back the Night. Okay. And, okay. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. And Take Back the Night has almost existed for 40 years as well. Oh, and that's wow. about that's a long time. Yeah. That's <laughs> about going taking to the streets and really just saying that the streets need to be safe for everybody and that sexual violence needs to end. And we partner with the Portland State University Women's Resource Center. And so um, I think about five years ago, we started doing Bike Back the Night. So there's a march and a bike ride on April 25th, okay. starting at PSU. And it's really to raise awareness about sexual assault and to s basically say that we don't, we want a community that's safe and we don't want people to experience sexual violence anymore. Is it a fundraiser or is it an uh, awareness raiser? It's an it's awareness, purely raise, yeah, oh, purely right. to raise awareness. And it's actually, it's really fun. Um, we ride from PSU through the East Bank Esplanade. So it's oh, yeah. somewhat and that's of a, a fun short, ride. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not that huge ride. It's, yeah. you know, a, a beginner rider could certainly right. do it. Right. Um, and it's just I really fun. <laughs> yes, you could definitely yeah, do, it. do it. And it's um, just a fun way to be with other people. And we usually have, um, before the event, we have some good speakers and performance. Um, we've had the, uh, oh my goodness, I'm not going to remember their name, but it's a group of synchronized bike Oh. Synchronized dancers that they use bikes. Really? And dance, yeah. Regular bicycles or are they they're unicycles? Like little, they're or? little BMX like oh, oh, yeah, yeah. bikes. Oh. And so they like do tricks on their bikes. Oh, I wish I could remember their name. Yeah. Um, well, I, it, will it be on your website eventually? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so it's People really want to know fun. they can follow up there, right? Right. <laughs> and that is. Uh, www.pwcl.org. That's right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, 
you work with uh, human trafficking issues. I mean, that's kind of part of it. Do you get involved in that at all? Well, we do in a way. So sort of indirectly? We, d we work with every survivor who, who calls us. Mm -hmm. And um, with a lot of the information coming out around human trafficking, a lot of that focus has been on minor victims of sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And that's actually something that we don't do, that we don't work on ourselves. I mean, youth may call us who have experienced that and we would help them. But there are other programs in the Portland metro area that are focused on minor victims of sex right. trafficking. But we like do- Like Janice, I think Janice Youth Janice Services youth has a division that does that. Janice Youth yeah. 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 So you do referrals. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but one of our advocates specializes in working with adults impacted by the sex industry. And so when one of the what she does is she works with folks who are engaged in commercial sex who are adults. Um, and sometimes they're needing help to, to leave the industry. Sometimes they're needing help to stay safe doing the work that they do. And mm -hmm. so her job is really, again, to kind of help folks maximize their safety, but then also to help other agencies kind of gain better competency in working with mm -hmm. sex workers because a lot of times if a sex worker goes into a nonprofit and seeks services there's a lot of shame and judgment about the work I was that they say, do. I, I yeah. imagine it would be difficult as somebody who would be a sex worker to, to be able to go and say this is what I do right. and and not be you know be I'd be afraid of being yeah. judged and um, you know unfairly judged yeah. because you know I, I think a lot of people are not in that because that's their first choice right. for a career yeah. you know so, we work uh, with a lot of people who um, in, who trade sex for their basic needs—a place mm -hmm. to sleep, mm -hmm. food to eat—and mm -hmm. so how, you know, and, and they might not even identify as a sex worker, but that right. is how they kind of survive. Yeah. Um, so we're they helping do what them. they think is their only option. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. a lot of you know, especially homeless women, are very vulnerable to sexual violence and sure. and yeah. having to you know having to exchange sex for their basic needs, right. yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, but tell me, um, we touched briefly on, um, oh, we have, before I, before we stop, mm -hmm. we do have a, um, a public service announcement that I want to show right at the end Great. as we close, because that's a, that's a good, it's, it's very short, but it's very powerful, mm -hmm. and I, and I like that, uh, that PSA, but um, we talked real briefly about men or, you know, other than women that, you know, and that could be transgender, I imagine, right. you know, mm -hmm. um, do you find it's easier for for um, you know men to to come forward and to to call you for for help? I'm not sure. Because it I seems like it's still kind mm -hmm. of a it's still yeah. some shame in that I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know what we know is that men are abused within their relationships with other men. Uh huh. Um, and so there's there and could for, be and with women too. Absolutely. Yeah. They yeah. may be abused by women as well. Yeah. So um, there is some shame in it, and resources are harder to come by. So uh -huh. if you're a man looking for shelter, there are local shelters that accept male survivors. Um, but it's that's somewhat new. Okay. So. But um, they can call you, and absolutely. you can do the referrals and, yes. and help them yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. And we provide case management to male okay. survivors as well. Good. Yeah. Good. Anything else that we need to know before I let you go here? Well, of course, I'd love folks to come to Safety in Numbers and to Bike Back so the open Night. To, open to the public. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. All ages party on the 5th. Um, and then, you know, and just encouraging people to check us out because you, what we know is that when survivors need help, they're more likely to go to their friends and family. Mm. And so we can be a resource to friends and family as well who want to know how to support survivors in their life. Great. Very yeah. well said. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much, Rebecca. And thanks yeah, for being absolutely. my guest here tonight. Thanks. So if you're interested in finding out more about the Portland Women's Crisis Line, be sure to check out their website. The information should be on your screen. And if you're interested in supporting the organization, you can go to their party and have a great time and support them at the same time. Or if you just want to be a part of it and uh, show your support, do the bike back the night. Yep. Thanks so much for watching our show tonight. This is Community Hotline. I'm Monica Weitzel. We'll see you next week. If you're a victim of rape or abuse, you might feel all alone. But out of 100 women and girls, 20 have been raped. 100 couples, 25 partners battered or abused. 100 men and boys, 10 sexually assaulted. But if you don't know who to call, or you're scared or embarrassed, you might feel alone, but you're not. PWCL, a crisis line for women, men, and youth. Understanding, helping, confidence.